Uh, thank you. I guess I did a pretty good job doing announcements last week. Let's see how this goes. If you don't like it, come back next week. I won't, I won't be preaching. I heard Pastor Todd's pretty good at it, so he'll be here. <laughs> um, okay, so we're, uh, we're in the middle of a series. Uh, what's the series called? Yeah. And how do you know that? Because there are ladders everywhere, yes. <laughs> also, it's written on there. Um, and we're f- what, what we're focusing on is, is stepping up to the next level in our spiritual growth. Um, last week, Pastor Todd opened the series talking about um, our grip. And I think we all have a memory of that because we were all holding our breath as he scaled up all the way up there. So now it's my turn. I'm kidding. (laughs) I'm kidding. No. (laughs) Um, I don't think I'm going to do that. Um, I won't be climbing any ladder. Maybe. No, I won't be climbing any ladder. (laughs) Today I want to look, I want to look into an episode in the book of Matthew where uh, Jesus and his disciples are on this long road trip from uh, Caesarea Philippi. They're going back to Jerusalem. Uh, so it's Matthew 18, for those of you that are have your Bibles. You can turn it on or open it, depending on your Bible of choice. Now, uh, let me give you some context. At this point in their journey, the disciples, they've had this breakthrough. They have had a few breakthrough moments in their spiritual growth. In a few chapters before, they've had this conversation where Peter uh, was able to... Um, you know, see that Jesus is the Christ. He, he confessed, you are the Christ. That's huge. Because why is that big? Because the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that's, that's why they were written. They were written for the sole purpose of convincing the readers of that time that this man, Jesus, is the Christ. So in Matthew, somebody's already gotten that far, and that's Peter. That's followed by a, uh, a story where Peter is then rebuked for just completely missing it. And he gets, says, get thee behind me, Satan. <sighs> you know, that's kind of how growth goes, right? Like you get good and you, you have a misstep. That's just kind of how it goes. And uh, now we're on this road back to Jerusalem, and we're about to experience one of Jesus' toughest, hardest, harshest lessons. How many, know, how many of you guys know, you Bible readers, avid Bible readers, that Jesus wasn't always rainbows and butterflies in his lessons? He's got some harsh lessons. And today, since we're talking about spiritual growth, you know, we're going to dive into some uh, tough <laughs> lessons. You guys ready? Yeah, turn to your neighbor and say, uh, hold your breath. And then turn to your other neighbor and say, oh. yeah. <laughs> All right, here we go. Matthew uh, 18, verses 1 through 9. We're going to break it up into three pieces. All right, so uh, verse 1. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And he, Jesus calls a little uh, child to him and placed the child among them. And he said, Truly, I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, and whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity to dive into your scripture and dive into your word. Father, I pray that you cover my words, open the ears and the hearts of those that are listening, and then you just be with us today. In the name of Jesus, Amen. So my, the title of my sermon today is called Don't Get Stuck. All right. And so we see in this verse here, Jesus is talking about, or rather they're the disciples, they're talking about who the greatest in the kingdom is. Now when we t- talk about kingdom of heaven, we have this image of like the heaven that we're going to go to, you know, at the end of time, at the end of life. However, Uh, In the minds of Jesus and the disciples, the kingdom of heaven was both a future reality as well as a present reality. In Matthew chapter 4, so a lot of chapters before this, 
Jesus steps onto the scene, and this is his first thing. He gets baptized. He spends time in the wilderness. He's about to start his ministry, and he goes, repent. Change the way you think because the kingdom of heaven is here, not coming, not it's going to happen to you at the end of your life or at the end of time. It's here. It's at hand. It's within reach. And so you have to change your perspective. That's what he means with repent. We have this, uh, we have this other like, image with repentance. We have this, like, on my knees, I'm sorry, Lord. Jesus is saying, no, 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 don't, you don't have to <laughs> say sorry. Change the way you think because your expectations of what the kingdom might look like is different, and I brought it to you. That's what Jesus is saying. And so he spends all of chapter 5, all of chapter 6, and all of chapter 7 explaining what the kingdom of heaven is. For those of you who are avid Bible students, you would know this as the Sermon on the Mount. This is Jesus' hypotheses, his thesis statement, you know, his um, manifesto where he's like, this is what the kingdom of heaven is. And he basically explains that this kingdom, it's an upside-down kingdom compared to what we're probably used to here. See, here in, on earth, in, in, in our earthly kingdom, we're used to when somebody hurts you, well, we're going to hurt you back. Yeah, that's kind of what we're used to here on earth, especially in the, in the political realm. A country hurts us, uh-uh, we're going to blow you to smithereens. That's how this works here. But Jesus comes up and says, if someone hurts you, what do you do? Turn the other cheek. And then what he's saying is not to let people walk all over you. What he's saying right there is he wants, the kingdom of heaven is a place that has such ridiculous compassion that if somebody hurts you, your first instinct is to go, I understand that you are angry and you felt the need to hurt me. What can I do to help you get rid of this anger that's inside of you? Do you need another cheek to, to slap? That's what that means. That kind of ridiculous compassion is what that kingdom is all about. And so he spends the chapters 5, 6, and 7 explaining all of this in really deep lessons, and it's crazy. And then chapter 8, he demonstrates this kingdom, but that's what this is all about. That's what the gospel really is. Sometimes we focus so much on the cross and the salvation, and this is the gospel, that you have salvation, your your sins are forgiven, and and that's great. But the gospel of Matthew starts at his birth, not his death and resurrection. The entire life of Jesus is part of that gospel, right? So we need to look at the entire life of Jesus to see exactly what is the good news that Jesus really is trying to tell us. That's beyond, hey, I can be forgiven from my sins and I can go to heaven. That's great news, don't get me wrong, it's great, but there's more to it. So the kingdom of heaven, according to Jesus, is both a present and future reality. And so... He says, unless, you're, unless you change and become like little children, you will, not, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. This isn't saying that, he's not gonna be able to, that you're not going to be able to go to heaven at the end of time. What he's saying is that to, in order to participate in the kingdom, that Jesus invites us to participate and be part of the change that turns this world upside down, you have to be like a child. That's in this life. I remember um, we just moved here um, a few months ago in February, and um, I have two kids, uh, Brightly and Archer. Archer's sick today, so he's at home. But when we first got here, um, we signed him up for daycare, and uh, shout out to daycare, yeah. Yeah, Melanie. <laughs> um, and uh, at the time, Archer was eight months when we had moved in, when we had moved here. He was eight months old. But the thing is, is that he has an older sister who, who was two. And this older sister had taught Archer all the ways of walking, running, climbing as a two-year-old should. And so we have an eight-month-old that is walking around, climbing things, unlike most eight-month-olds. You know, it was a bit unusual. He was an early walker. And the thing is, is that in the child care, uh, you are <laughs> you're w- if you're under one year old, you are in the infant room where there are a lot of cribs and not a lot of, you know, physical activity because you're supposed to be an infant, not a running, jumping, climbing child. 
Um, and so for the first few months of Archer, of Archer being in childcare, he, he struggled. He, um, not, not, that, uh, not on the childcare's part, just, you know, that's the circumstances in which he was put into. He was put into a place that, you know, wasn't really challenging him because he was just, he needed something more. And so it wasn't until he had turned one that we were like, yeah, and he was able to go to the next class. And now he's in the same class as his sister. And literally from, it was like one week to the next, he used to cry every time we brought him to childcare. And now he just doesn't even care. He doesn't even necessarily want to leave when we pick him up. Um, and this is amazing. What changed? What changed was Archer's circumstances, his environment. And what Jesus is saying here, he's not saying that immaturity or your young Christianity is going to keep you from going to heaven or participating in the kingdom. He's setting up a much larger warning that begins with a childlike posture. Jesus is saying that unless we change the patterns and the environment, the circumstances around us, what we're in, that we will, the, the circumstances in our lives, if, unless we change the circumstances in our lives that stunt our growth, we will remain in a posture um, of not growing. So don't, don't get stuck in, on, the, on the ladder to growth. Don't get stuck on your way up, Okay. He's saying that the refusal, Jesus is saying the refusal to remain humble and teachable, which is the childlike posture he's talking about, to remain humble and teachable is an automatic, and this is where it gets tough, it's an automatic disqualification, not from heaven, but from heaven's influence in this world. And you forfeit your capacity to be a conduit for that kingdom, that kingdom that heals the lepers, the kingdom that sets people free. Okay, so step one, not to get stuck on your way up in your spiritual growth, all right? That's easy. That's get, it gets harder. <laughs> you guys with me still? Yeah? Is it hurting yet? Hard lessons? Yeah. Don't blame me. D blame Jesus. I'm just a conduit. <laughs> okay, let's continue reading. Verse uh, 6, if, if anyone causes one of these little ones... Then p Jesus pauses. He's no longer talking about children. Who's he talking about? Yeah, those who believe in me. If anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me, to stumble, it would be better for them to have a large millstone hung around their neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. Woe to the world because of the things that cause people to stumble. Such things must come but woe to the person through whom they come. What does it, what does it mean to stumble? I mean, we could probably, to sin, to fall, that's right, yeah, to fail. <laughs> before, uh, before he was the 45th president of the United States, he was a host of a game show type thing on TV. And Donald Trump, uh, was a host of a show called The Apprentice. Anybody used to watch that? I used to watch that. I used to love that show. And um, yeah, that's where his catchphrase came from. You're fired. Yeah, that was terrible. I'm so sorry. I'll never do that again. <laughs> but in the on The Apprentice, basically what would happen is he'd have a bunch of people, like business people, business minded, sometimes celebrities. They'd come up and they'd they'd have these projects, and most of the time they're fundraising projects. Uh, to try and, you know, raise money. And usually when it's celebrities especially, it's usually for, like, uh, some sort of cause. But then uh, at the end of each project, the failing team would come, come into the boardroom, and it's scary, and, you know, Donald Trump is there with, like, dim lights. And, you know, I don't want to be in a room with Donald Trump with dim lights. That's frightening. And, and <laughs> he... Uh, would kind of like go after the failing team and, tr and, and whoever was the project manager, they were usually the ones on the chopping block. Most of the time, the one that was managing the project of the failing team was the one that was going to get fired. And you could usually kind of predict that. Why is that? Because when <laughs> there is a higher burden of responsibility placed on you when you begin to scale up in your growth, 
when you start taking l- positions of leadership or growth, especially when we're higher up on the ladder, there is a higher burden of responsibility that falls upon you. What's interesting about this verse, and I, this is what I love about Jesus right here, is he's, he's very nuanced. Jesus recognizes that this world is broken. He says is there, are, there are things in this world that will trigger so many different people to stumble. And Jesus gets it. There he says, woe to the world because of the things that cause people to stumble. So he's saying, shame on the world. Shame on the world for, for, this, for being broken. For all the things that the world causes us to, st- like, for all, the, for all the things that are in the world that causes us to stumble. Because this world is imperfect. People lose their jobs for terrible reasons. People get sick. People die when we were praying for their health. This world, Jesus came and died and resurrected to, to break death, but, it ha- but what hasn't happened yet is, that the, is the influence of sin and death. We're still feeling the effects of sin and death on, in this world. And we'll continue to feel that until Jesus returns. Does that, does that make sense? You guys following me? And that's why, I mean, there are still tragedies in this world. And these tragedies are going, sometimes they're going to cause people to sin. You know, how many people do we know in your life who's made bad decisions out of desperation? They're not bad people. They've just made poor choices because they've been dealt a terrible hand. And that's, that's the world that Jesus recognizes right here. He says, woe to the world. Let me read that. Woe to the world because of the things that cause people to stumble. He says, such things must come. These things are going to happen. But then he ends it with saying, but woe to the person through whom they come. It's one thing for the world to be responsible for someone to stumble. But shame on you if, y- if, if somebody stumbles because of you, because of your sin. So if you run into someone, just an example, if you run into someone who is just in desperate need of money, they're just broke, they can't even pay for gas, and you, out of emphasis, out of your own greed, decide not to help them, and then they move on and make a poor decision that hurts a lot of people, that's what Jesus is talking about. I understand not all of us can give at every time. Times are tough, (laughs) but... If you act out of greed and that greed leads somebody else to do something terrible, woe to you. And that's a difficult lesson. And that's what Jesus is saying. Again, don't be mad at me. Be mad at Jesus. It's his words. So if the words that I choose to speak over you are not teeming with life and blessing and encouragement, and if they're instead discouraging you and causing you to get angry, and then that anger causes you to go and hurt others, and then that person goes and does something else that possibly ends lives or robs people or shows people, abuses people, all of that traces back to you. This is what Jesus is saying. This ladder business, it's serious business. Climbing up a ladder, it's serious business, and we got to take it seriously. Are y'all with me? Y'all still love me? Okay, I hope so. Verse 8. Oh, sorry. So, number one, don't get stuck on your way up. Number two, don't get stuck getting others stuck. Cool? Got it? Written it down? Written it in your heart? (laughs) Let's continue reading. Verse 8 and 9. Now, this is where Jesus, you thought Jesus was being hard. Wait, wait, Wait till you hear this. If your hand or your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life maimed or crippled than to have two hands or two feet and be thrown into eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out, and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into the fire of hell. (sighs) Man, that one hurts, right? Who's, uh, who's here, who here has gouged their eyes out before? 
who here thought about it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, let me break down this verse for you guys um, so you're not going home and gouging your eyes out and telling, telling people that I told you to. Um, in Jewish scripture, you always have to pay attention with scriptures uh, that are refer- referencing hands, feet, and eyes. They're almost always a reference to um, your perception, your action, and your trajectory. Okay, yeah, there you go. You learned something. Yay. Win. <laughs> yeah. Um, in fact, um, this is just whoever said that. If you're interested, go and read the story of where, where Queen Jezebel dies. And there's a little bit of a fun little hint there with the hand, feet, and eye stuff. Yeah. Fun, fun stuff. Bloody, but fun. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, come on. It's the, bu- it's the Book of Kings. There's just a lot of a lot of rated R stuff there. Okay. Um, let me back up. Back in here. What Jesus is trying to show us with the hand, foot, and eye uh, metaphor, okay, is that how you perceive something affects what you do. And what you do affects the trajectory of your life. Then he says, he says it's, remember, he's, he, he gives the warning, it's better for you to get, the, get rid of these things than to enter the fires of hell. Now, <sighs> here we go. Uh, turn to your neighbor and say, uh, we're going to dive deep. Okay? And then close your nose and take a deep breath. Okay. So there are, um, one of the issues, I guess I would say, I don't want to call it issue, but one of the things with English translations of the Bible is that the word hell actually gets translated from different words. Sometimes Jesus is talking about a, a destination, the bad place. Um, in this instance, it's actually the word Gehenna. So it's the Greek word Gehenna. And the Greek word Gehenna is the word for an actual geographical place called the Valley of Hinnom. Okay? Let me put my glasses because I'm, I'm being a nerd right now. It's just this word comes from a story in this in Second Kings. Uh, in the book of Second Kings, there's a king of um, his name is Manasseh, and he's a bad he's a bad guy, bad king, and he was so, he was so evil. He introduced the worship of this Canaanite idol, false god. His name was Molech. And Molech, you could win Molech's favor uh, through child sacrifice yeah all of us are already like whoa whoa yeah it's in the book of second kings told you rated our stuff man <coughs> uh so he introduces child sacrifice and build altars in the this place they built altars in the place called valley of hinnom and it's actually it's a real place there it is that's here's this is hell as as we read it in matthew 18 This is what Jesus is referring to when he says hell, okay? And it's beautiful. Okay, I'm getting there. I'm getting there. You guys are like, whoa, wait, whoa, 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 whoa. Just put a pause on what you know about hell and just follow me. Jesus is speaking about this place called the Valley of Hinnom that was translated into English as the word hell. I don't know why, but here we are. He's talking about a valley. We, We read it as hell. So th- he, uh, here, uh, he's talking about this valley. And let me uh, go to the map. Okay, so this is the city of Jerusalem as we know it. The, this top right corner, that's the Dome of the Rock. We know the Dome of the Rock, the big temple with the psh. And this green part down there, that's the Valley of Hinnom. That's hell in this instance. Okay, so what happened in this valley is really interesting because these Israelites under the king Manasseh, which is the evil, evil king with child sacrifice, they built altars. And what, what is there in altars? When you're doing a sacrifice, what, what do you put on the altars? Fire, exactly. So you have these fires of on the altars. And uh, God, he was so, so angered by this that he uses the prophet Jeremiah to bring about justice. And God says to Israel, he says, you have 
you have lit the fires of Hinnom to consume the innocent, the children. So he was going to allow the kingdom of Babylon to come in, conquer Israel, and the bodies of the people that died there were going to be burned in that same valley. Yeah, that's God's justice right there. He's like, you, you want to do fires? Have the fire. You'll be burned in that fire. Understand? Following me? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I'm doing my best. All right. So what's happening here is this, this let's put a pause real quick. We're, we're in America right now in 2022, but in the minds of the Israelites in Jesus' time, Jesus is saying this as a story. He's using this as an example, and he's calling back to a really dark part of Israel's history. It's a dark reminder of Israel's history, and that's what he's really trying to communicate, is he's saying, Jesus is using this image as a great warning. He said, who lit, who lit the fires in the valley? Who, who lit the fires? Yes, people did. People did. Humans. So hell here, when we read the word hell in this specific passage, it's not this future reality for those who don't believe and for those, you know, the bad place. It, it is a present reality. It is a hell of our own making. This is where Jesus gets really serious. He says he's wanting us to see how serious he is about leaving our character flaws unchecked. And so many times we kind of ride the, the grace wave and say, yeah, well, grace covers me. And that's great. He does. It does cover you. But it does not an excuse to, you know, leave your character flaws unchecked. It's not an excuse to not step up the ladder and grow. And what Jesus is saying is be very careful to leave these, these, these dark parts of our soul, these dark parts of who we are, of our humanity, be careful to leave them unchecked because it is better for you to suffer the most severe pain than to leave that unchecked. And then what should end up happening most likely is that you'll get caught in a hell of your own making. Not a literal fire. Just when character flaws are left unchecked, you're creating a downward spiral for yourself and for those around you. And that's what Jesus is getting at here in this passage specifically. Okay, we can, we can have another sermon another day where we're talking about a different kind of hell. But this kind of hell is a hell of our own making. It is a geographical place, and it's a dark part of their history. And Jesus is saying, remember that darkness? Remember that bad time that we're all ashamed to talk about? Yeah, if you leave your character flaws unchecked, that's what's going to happen. And that's just like a rude awakening for people in this time. The disciples, they're fooling around. They're trying to like, you know, be m trying to play around who's the best in the kingdom. D Jesus says, stop. Don't even let that pride get in your heart. You have to be like a child. And you have to make sure that you don't make others fall. And even more than that, fix those things in your heart. Because leaving them unchecked, it's going to hurt you even more than it hurts those around you. And that's Jesus' lesson. So uh, you, can you can come up, um, Rhonda. Thank you. So we have three, three places not to get stuck. Don't get stuck on your way up. Don't get stuck getting others stuck. And don't get stuck in your own hell. All right? I promise next time that I speak, I'll speak on a more jolly note. I promise. But today, this morning, I want to present one of Jesus' most serious lessons. Because if we're going to take this, this idea, if we're going to take the latter lesson seriously, we have to be serious about change ourselves. We have to be serious to commit to getting rid of the dirty stuff inside of us. The stuff that we just kind of tolerate in ourselves. All right, so I want to invite you guys to stand up. Amen. All right. And 
And um, if, if you're at a place and you heard this message and you're like, yeah, I'm all in, you know, I'm ready to commit to just taking out all of the, all of the, the things that don't look like the fruit of the Spirit. Anything that isn't love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, faithfulness, goodness, self-control. Did I get them all? Thank you. Gentleness. Um, anything that isn't that, I want to get it out because that's what I want to, to embody. You know, we, we talk about wanting to have a lot of Holy Spirit activity here. We want to be a church that's just, you know, full of the presence and just active in the Holy Spirit. And a lot of times, I'm not sure why, I mean, I grew up in the church myself, and so we just kind of automatically associate that with the gifts of the Spirit. We want to, When we say, yeah, we want to be a church that's like Spirit-filled and, and active in the Holy Spirit, we're talking about healings and prophecy and all those crazy things, but then we just kind of like, shh fruit of the spirit go away you know we want to do the cruel superhero stuff but not not work to be vessels of love and joy and patience and kindness and so i want to focus on that let's focus on that on our way up the ladder before we even try to heal people and stuff like that which is good let's focus internally first let's get that stuff out because that's the way that we can be conduits of the kingdom all right, so uh, I'm not gonna do a big altar call and get everybody here and, and, and weep together um, because I'm hungry. But if if this is you, if this is if you are somebody that you want to you want to commit to, you know, taking this matter seriously and climbing up the ladder the right way, you know, not messing around. Would you raise your hand? Raise your hand in the room. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm just going to do like a prayer over everybody then. All right. So uh, let's lift our hands and close our eyes. And Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for, for your grace, first and foremost, Father, for your grace and your patience with us, Lord, that even as imperfect beings, Lord, you still love us. You still uh, want to partner with us and the kingdom, your kingdom, is still available to us in spite of our mess-ups, Father. Today, Lord, we, we come to you and we say, Father, sorry for not taking some of this stuff seriously, Lord. Um, even if it's just out of neglect, not intentionally, Father, just stuff that we might have just been ignorant about, Lord. Help us to grow and help us to, help us to grow in the painful way. Not literally experiencing pain, but in the way that that requires severe humility, Father. The ones that the, the type of growth that we have been we've been stubborn to avoid, Father, stubbornly trying to avoid. Father, help us to grow beyond those character flaws that have been with us for years and years that we just can't shake off father that we just can't get over it lord help us today to give us the grace holy spirit to to step over that hurdle and finally step into the the type of person the type of humanity that you died for us to be we thank you father we love you we praise you in the name of jesus amen all right thank you guys so much Hug somebody. Have a wonderful Sunday. Enjoy your Sunday nap. And be blessed.